to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. In the 18th century, a small fishing village on the western coast of India transformed itself into a premier center of trade and commerce. This development of Mumbai, then known as Bombay, has been intrinsically linked with its port. The ships that docked here helped connect the subcontinent with the rest of the world. But the material to build these ships came from somewhere local. People often forget that while Mumbai is surrounded by the Arabian Sea on one end, its other end extends into the Great Western Ghats. And it is the forests of this hinterland that proved to be another geographical asset in the urbanization of Mumbai. The fuel required for the city's growth was sourced from here. The story of Mumbai's connection with wood is not much dealt into, and its story also has a lesson to be learned. We spoke to environmental historian Dr. Louisa Rodrigues, who has done ample research on the topic. She tells us what piqued her interest. Before becoming an environmental historian, I did a lot of research in Bombay as an urban space from a political and historical perspective in the 19th century. During that time, I found that there were recurrent famines in Bombay presidency, which was somehow rooted to environmental degradation. After years of research, it all came down to one commodity, the wood. So I found that wood was one of the most important assets of the colonial state, the British government in Bombay, to execute various infrastructure development, right from shipbuilding to railways to housing and making ornamental furniture. The wood that helped build Mumbai or Bombay as a commercial hub was sourced from the Western Ghats across from forests of Maharashtra and Gujarat down to Karnataka and Kerala. This wood helped Bombay become a commercial centre under the British. Intracity and intercity trade was only through boats and ships. But the British were not the first who introduced shipping to India. Before the advent of the British rule, shipbuilding was one of the most prominent industries of Western India. Ships were built of tea because of its white and resistant quality and its durability. Major shipyards were at Surat, Bombay, Daman and Mysore. The major shipbuilding centres of the Maratha government and the Peshwas were at Thana, Kalyan, Vivandi, Alibag, Vijaydurg and Marwan. In Gujarat and Maharashtra, carts and buffaloes were used to transport timber from the forest to the rivers wherein Malabar and Kanara elephants were preferred to drag timber to the river edge than labourers who were reluctant to go into high jungles. Before the Marathas, the practice of shipbuilding in Bombay was taken up by the Portuguese who took over the islands in 1534 by signing the Treaty of Basin with Sultan Bahadur Shah of Gujarat. Within their fort at Vasai, they built an entire city on the outskirts of present-day Mumbai. Here, they used wood to build houses, bungalows, churches, besides ships. In the 17th century, it was the port of Surat in Gujarat that dominated the shipbuilding industry. Surat had prospered through sea trade for many centuries. But with the development of Bombay port, Surat began to experience a gradual decline. The geopolitical significance of Bombay and its location between the forests of Malabar and Gujarat, which could ensure a regular supply of timber for the construction of ships, emboldened the colonial state to construct ships in the Bombay port. Bombay was also known for possessing a natural harbour and the best port even during rainy season. However, no great progress was made until 1735 when Lauji Nasirunji Varya was called from Surat, a master carpenter, to construct ships at the naval dockyard at Bombay. Lauji, known for his craftsmanship and shipbuilding, utilized his expertise 
European technology and Indian raw material to produce good quality ships. He came to Bombay with 10 Parsi carpenters and during his 40 years tenure of mastership, he built 20 ships for the East India Company and 40 merchant vessels. But these ships were small with 6 to 10 guns and ranged between 200 to 500 and 800 tons. The year 1800 was a turning point in the British naval history in India in owing to the construction of warships of the Bombay Do at the Bombay Dockyard, the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte in France in 1799 and his threat to India induced the British to construct the warships in the early 19th century to maintain their supremacy at sea. The construction of these warships required enormous amount of timber. A variety of teak, timber and blackwood was also utilized to build houses, bungalows, public buildings in Bombay. With the commencements of railway and its extension in Bombay and Bombay presently, different type of timber was used primarily because timber by 1850 was exhausted and the state had to go deeper into the forest to procure tea. So besides tea, iron, irul, hair, babul, jungle wood was utilized for sleepers and beer fuel for the railways. While wood was being used to make ships, railways and houses, it was also being used to make a type of ornamental furniture. Known as Bombay Blackwood, it was quite a fusion of Indian and European styles. With the emergence of Bombay as an important trading centre, many furniture craftsmen migrated to Bombay. This signal dramatic changes in the furniture industry. The shifting of the craftsmen with its skill and know-how to the trans-regional market was a key factor in the commercialization of this local Gujarati industry. Calf furniture still indigenous to Gujarat took root in the industrial city of Bombay and became famous as Bombay Blackwood furniture and Bombay boxes that adorned the houses of the elites both Europeans and Indian. In fact, the furniture industry was a lucrative business and many agents and companies were engaged in transporting this furniture across the globe in America, England, East Africa and South Asia. But with the upsides of the wood also came the downsides. In the early 19th century, the British passed several regulations marking their monopoly over timber trade in Western India. Along with jeopardizing the interests of the local merchants, this also resulted in high-scale deforestation. The British postulated a three-phase deforestation of Western India. The very first phase focalized endeavors in tapping the timber resources to nurture the growth of the shipbuilding and civic construction at Bombay which was subsequently followed by the construction of several houses and bungalows. The forests of Malabar, Kanara, Travancore, Konkan and Gujarat were largely robbed, especially those mushroomed around the riverbank terrains were more vulnerable to such plucking. The forest policy of the British affected the indigenous people and the merchant. The unhappiness of the people and the merchant was manifested in the outward expression through petitions and opposition to Bombay government. It is this social unrest that posed a great threat to the colonial state was sensed by the British and soon the state ended the timber monopoly. This set the stage for second phase of deforestation that continued for a decade and a half till 1838. It accentuated the deforestation process followed by years of regression in Western India. Resultantly, the undisputed government forests with stress, unrestricted fellings, encouraged by timber agencies, which made large advances to native contractors to provide timber. The devastation was to such an extent that it led to acute timber shortage by the late 1830s, and on the other hand, large tracts of dense scrub and fine timber were cleared by fire or axe in line with the land use policy of the British, 
so that agricultural ventures could be taken up. The third phase of deforestation too marked by the establishment and the extension of the railways in the middle of the 19th century in Bombay and Bombay Presidency saw the constant and relentless pressure on the forest of Western India because of the increasing demand for sleepers and fuel thus resulting in timber famine in the late 1815. The shortage of timber increased timber prices and thus compared the state at time to replace wooden sleepers with iron sleepers. The colonial forestry was largely responsible in denuding the forest of Western India. The vast destruction of the interior of the forests and the acute shortage of timber led to a crisis. The British had learned their lesson. The government was compelled to initiate conservation measures and a policy of natural resource management came into place. Serious attempts were made by conservators and collectors in North Kannara, Surat, Khandesh, Konkan and Dharwar to regenerate the forest. The concentration of the British on a limited number of species and the development of teak and bauble plantation certainly modified the floristic composition of forest and threatened biodiversity. In reality, the state lacked the techniques of scientific forestry and failed to devise concrete strategies to conserve the forest. It is not surprising, therefore, that due to this failure that the Britishers appointed German experts who were well known in scientific forestry and were invited to regenerate the forests of India. The British were responsible for deforesting this region by their policy of commercialization of forests, especially teak trees. By 1860, the British also halted shifting cultivation carried out by the indigenous people, resulting in forest fires, which according to them was responsible for the destruction of the forests. But the vested interest of the British was in continuing the plantations of coffee and spices, which was largely responsible for destruction of flora and affected the biodiversity. But the question is, is the situation of forests in India, especially the Western Ghats, which have been recognized as a World Heritage Site, any better today? Western Ghats has been a source of livelihood for indigenous people. It has been a fertile region, both for flora and fauna. In the last few decades, the forest cover in the Western Ghats has been severely degraded due to human activity and rapid urbanization. An appalling 35% of the original forests in the Western Ghats region have been destroyed. There has been urgent need to ban mining and impose restrictions on construction activities in the fragile ecological regions of the Western Ghats. The post-colonial governments also followed in the British footsteps in exploiting the forest. Thousands of acres of forest were cut, resulting in depletion of the green cover. The conservation policies were not different from the colonial government. They began monocrop cultivation by planting trees of commercial importance like acacia, hirda, and eucalyptus and tea, thereby destroying the biodiversity of the forest. We also were engaged in illegal blasting of the hills for minerals and granite. It is time that we see Western Ghats as a closely linked ecosystem. Even in this grim scenario, there is wonderful eco-restoration work and organic farming being carried out. There is still a possibility of regenerating the denuded green zone, degraded forest and rivers, but there are very few keeping in mind the large landscape of the Western Khans. Today, the conversation around conservation is so important. In Mumbai, there is not much wood left to be used for public projects like metro and civic construction. But trees are still being slashed to execute these projects without having a sustainable balance between cityscape and the natural environment. In fact, the last few remaining tracks of wood are also under threat. At a time like this, it is of crucial importance that we reflect on our past and take a grasp of the situation sooner than later.